Let's get the view from Greenpeace now. We can speak to its executive director, Kumi Naidu. Uh, Kumi, great to see you here. What are your thoughts immediately as we finish this conference? I think it's a betrayal of our children and grandchildren's future. It's out of touch with the science. It's out of touch with what's actually happening on the ground, like we see in the Philippines, Hurricane Sandy, and so on. And basically what we've seen is an absence of political will and a uh, really desperate state of cognitive dissonance. You know, all the, re all the reality is saying we need to act. Of course, we knew that there will be a face-saving way of saying, you know, we've got an outcome. The message uh, really is that there's uh, no uh, targets, uh, emission targets anywhere near what the science is saying. And at best, if you want to call it, we'll say we've made incremental baby steps forward when what is needed is a transformative step to actually uh, try to reverse uh, but, but it, the direction we're on. There was a quite a low ambition here at Doha, wasn't there? We were really looking to find a pathway forward to the coming years, especially to 2015 for this universal agreement. Haven't we made steps in that direction? Basically, we have set up here to lose this decade. Because remember, when we went to Copenhagen in 2009, at that point, the world was saying, and the science was saying, we needed a fair, ambitious, and legally binding treaty. The science is saying emissions must peak by 2015 and start coming down. Now, essentially, what is being agreed here is we only get a treaty in 2015, and then we only start implementing in 2020. That is far too late and will set us on the course of a four-degree world very easily. The message that we have to take away from this as civil society is that we have to now build the biggest ever movement ever, get young, young people in particular need to wake up and see that their futures are being sold down the toilet here and that they have to actually stand up and actually take leadership because the fossil fuel industry has been in this conference, let's be very clear. Governments have come here with mandates, not from the citizens, but from the oil, coal and gas companies to actually block the winners coming out of this COP has been largely oil, coal and gas companies. Okay, okay, well, let's just move on to finance. We're running out of okay. time because there's a very big, important issue. And we're talking about $100 billion a year from the year 2020, which as you say is a little bit late, but it's, it's a great deal of money. The point is, where is that money going to come from? And you're not, you can't really be that surprised that nations, developed nations, are reluctant to talk about handing over those sort of sums. Well, there are mechanisms that developed nations, particularly the United States, is blocking. There's uh, a financial transaction tax could, that could generate 60 billion easily. Uh, there's other levies like airline levies, all of which are being blocked. Then we have to ask ourselves, where is the wisdom and leadership when even the CIA and the Pentagon is saying that the biggest future threat to peace, security and stability is going to come from climate impacts and we still have an immoral, obscene level of expenditure in military spending. A fraction of that expenditure could actually be diverted. But the reality is that if there is political will, will money can be found for war. You know, overnight trillions of dollars were found to bail out the banks, the bankers and the bonuses. If our future of humanity is what is at stake, 100 billion actually is a very small amount of money.